Welcome to the CFA Society San Francisco podcast, where we interview and discuss current topics with leading members of the Bay Area investment community. This week, Tanya Subatang, Senior Membership Manager with CFA Society San Francisco, sits down with Christopher Brown, CFA, Chief Investment Officer and Partner with Democracy Investments. Listen in as they discuss the International Equity Index and how capital flow can potentially impact a country's political environment. Good afternoon, Chris. It was great seeing you again. Good to see you, Tanya. Thanks for having me on. I am so excited. We're going to have such a wonderful conversation today. And I want to tell our listeners that this is going to be what a timely conversation we're going to have given what's going on in the environment. So I want to kind of jump straight in. But before we talk about Democracy Investment, which is a company that you helped co-founded, I'd like to start in the beginning. Can you quickly share with us your brief professional journey and how you got to be in your current role as Chief Investment Officer for for democracy investment, and maybe a little bit of what your role currently entails. Sure, I'll I'll do the quick, hopefully the quick resume walkthrough. Uh, started out, I was uh, went to undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, uh, graduated from there, and went um, into asset management. Worked at uh, a little shop in Santa Monica called Pacific Income Advisors. Uh, that was run by a gentleman named Lloyd McAdams, and he he had come out of uh, the old uh, Security Pacific Investment Management. Then moved up to the Bay Area and worked at a um, growth equity shop called Harris, Patal, Sullivan, and Smith. I worked a lot with Jack Sullivan, that group, um, at really doing like portfolio administration, that kind of thing. Left Harris in, uh, let's see, 94, 95, and went into business with my with my father. We um, He had put together a group to manufacture shipping containers out of Latin America, down in Venezuela. Oh, wow. So uh, we had put together a group that manufacture and rent and, and all that kind of stuff. As the Chavistas were moving in, I took that as a divine signal to go back to business school. I had the, still had the international blog. I was very much uh, a believer in sort of globalization and and and, where, and that the world was going to this more uh, global environment. So I went to Thunderbird and got a degree in uh, international business. Did some work for some uh, merchant banks. Worked for uh, Autodesk in their venture group, where I met uh, eventually one of the uh, one of the other partners in democracy investments, Julie Kane. Well, we can talk a bit more about that later. Worked for a uh, uh, managed some fixed income, uh, mostly uh, govies and California munis for uh, California Investment Trust in, in San Francisco. I had some friends at Franklin uh, knock on my door and, and invite me over there, where I worked at uh, Fiduciary Trust, which was their um, high net worth and ultra high net worth uh, pri- uh, private wealth group. And then moving into Franklin Templeton uh, Solutions, where it was more portfolio construction for institutions and uh, and the like. And we helped to launch sort of the liquid all first sort of liquid alts product. I got to cover um, the Western United States uh, and Latin America, and so had some uh, great trips and 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 uh, you know, very insightful to to be touring down there. Uh, left Franklin in, in 2018, and uh, again, as I mentioned, we had a family history in Venezuela, and we had uh, Maduro on the runway, uh, ready to ready to leave. But uh, uh, Vladimir Putin told me, "You have to stay. You've got all my gold. I can't have you go." <laughs> so we 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 were we were initially looking at doing a, a Venezuelan sort of reconstruction fund, uh, mm-hmm. things like that, to, for for when that opens up, and and uh, hopefully someday that that'll that'll be an opportunity. Got some interesting insights. Uh, that, again, crazy sort of things where. The China, and it's a great case study for for any of the listeners out there to look at the uh, China Ocean Wide um, Genworth financial transaction. If you want to get a look at and sort of see uh, where the, the the cracks in the in the real estate bubble in China were starting to show, it's a fascinating thing. It's a it was a deal where Chinese real estate company trying to buy uh, Genworth Life Insurance business and took four years, could never get it done. There were and, and you know. Plot twists and turns. That's a podcast all in itself. It's like it, it's like you know, you know. Anyway, true crime podcast <laughs> or something. Anyway, um, but that that gave me some insight. Uh, there were some things that happened during that time that gave me some insight into into sort of things that were going on. Uh, how that got me to uh, democracy and in investments. Um, my colleague, who I mentioned earlier, Julie uh, Kane. Um, her background: she happens to be a, um, a former naval uh, helicopter pilot. She flew helicopters in the Philippines and. She She'd always, we'd always bounced ideas around doing 
more on the impact side. And we started talking uh, as 2019 was was uh, rolling into 2020. Uh, her concern was around index construction and greater inclusion um, of uh, authoritarians and particularly the, the Chinese push for greater inclusions in, in broad-based uh, international equity indices. It was like, well, what can be done about this? Uh, we had once kicked around an idea, well, gee, is there a way to do sort of a clean China fund? And, and as we talked to a series of experts, it's like, no, that's pretty hard to do. And so it became, we, we were kicking this around and uh, Julie brought in uh, the, our, our third partner, a gentleman by the name of, of Rick Rakoski, who um, Rick's background is he's um, got a PhD from MIT in r- marine robotics. Uh, wow. if, that'll, if, if, that, if that'll tell you anything, he builds uh, undersea drones for the US Navy and, and, and Google. You know, he's got the, one of those minds and, and, and personalities where he was modeling, you know, coronavirus issues with using the Economist Democracy Index. And he said, well, hey, why don't you, you know, think about using think about using this thing? And so um, I, I call that sort of the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup moment. We took chocolate and peanut butter and, and, and made it into something that we thought was 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 pretty good. Uh, and so we were off to the races, at least with with the business. Um, as far as what I'm doing, uh, you know, what I, my role is now with all of that, the investment process that we have is, is you know, maybe as we discuss it further, is, is very, very simple. Uh, we're all systematic and, and our algorithm is um, extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily simple. So it's really more about, you know, for us as, you know, both pro- evangelism and product development, because I don't think that there are just as many folks kind of doing what we're doing and just getting people's heads around the idea uh, that um, you know, maybe tilting using democracy might be uh, an attractive way of doing things. So I want to kind of go back a little bit because I know you touched upon it really briefly, but why don't you uh, explain to our listener exactly what democracy investment is and the fund that you guys created. I'd love sure. to think that would kind of give a better understanding um, uh, further in our conversation. Yeah. Um, so what the fund is, is we, is we t- currently right now, the, 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 the straightforward strategy that we have right now is we take the, uh, an equivalent uh, of the uh, Acqui XUS index. Uh, we happen to use Selective um, we, uh, because they're cheaper, quite frankly. And um, uh, and they give us great service and all that other fun stuff. Um, <laughs> no, I'll give them a pitch. I mean, uh, they, they, they've been they've been great. They've been great partners, and I, I'd I'd like to support our partners. So they give us a list. It's around twenty seven hundred names, large and mid cap, from that essentially map to the the uh, the Miski schema. And um, we go ahead and decide a country of risk to every single security into in that uh, in that index. Uh, we then take the so Taiwan Semiconductor is usually the number one holding. We take the Taiwan democracy score because that's a pretty easy one to, to adjudicate multiply the market cap by the democracy score you get a raw you get a, a raw number do that for all 2700 and then just everything's a percent of the total and and you've normalized that's your democracy index and what that what that does is on a relative basis um, it tilts away from authoritarian regimes China at the time when we did it Russia Saudi Arabia Turkey and towards more uh, democratic ones which in this case were more Nordics, Taiwan, Australia, Japan, that type of thing. And um, we uh, so we have the index and then we also have a, a corresponding ETF for that. The ETF uh, right now does index replication around. It has about 187 names and um, it's uh, DMCY uh, on, on your uh, NYSE dial. And we use index replication right now with a couple of uh, about 18 or 19, both regional and country ETFs. And then the rest are, are uh, individual securities in the portfolio. Why is democracy investment been given a name, but you guys are mainly focusing in countries that are are embracing democracy or, you know, in that political environment. Is that kind of a passion project that you all three had? Or was it, you know, you mentioned earlier that it was like an impact that you guys wanted to make. What was the motivation for starting? So, yes, it's 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 a passion project because, I you know, I think if you believe that you if you can give somebody their freedom, I think that's the, you know, that's the most wonderful gift you can, you can give. So the, 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 the notion of at least 
least having been in financial services and, uh, you know, being able to find, you know, motivation, it's nice to be able to wake up and put your feet on the floor and, and at least feel like you're doing something for this. Again, mm-hmm. you know, our, our purpose is right now that, that, that we think you, given what's happening in the world, that, that, mm-hmm. uh, this form of, inv- that this, that this way will outperform that way. Yeah. At the, at, at, so that's at the small scale. At large scale, this thing becomes weaponized and actually mm-hmm. starts to, and actually starts to really influence capital flows. And I, I, there would be a lovely problem. It would be a lovely problem to have. And, 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 uh, and I'll say this, I'll, I'll, I'll encourage like folks who, uh, I want to give a shout out to Perth Toll uh, to take this opportunity because um, she's got her freedom fund and um, they're doing it in, she's doing it in emerging markets. And to me, a rising tide uh, lifts all boats in these things um, uh, that just using, uh, being able to use that dimension, I think, you know, is, is important. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy to give, uh, uh, give a shout out and recognition to others and tell people to, to go take a look at it. Cause I, again, we're having a hard enough time getting people to embrace just this general concept. I think she's doing a great job uh, pushing it. Why do you think that is? I mean, this is a form of, I, I guess, I, I look to you. Would you consider this a form of impact investing or ESG? And, you know, you're contributing to the betterment of the world, not in a save the tree kind of way, but in, in you know, in human rights kind of way. Why do you think there's uh, maybe having people are having a harder time in embracing this? I think first and foremost, it's a marketing issue. Uh, I don't think either, uh, you know, in the person or we have the, the, the marketing reach. Some of the larger players do. Mm-hmm. Um, th- th- this is a relatively new, this is, it's a relatively new concept out there. And, uh, and it's moving faster than I think anybody uh, that, that anybody's been expecting. I mean, it, it just, for whatever reason, um, and, and you're nodding and, and I can, we, we can see each other, even if it's on the, on the podcast, you're <laughs> nodding your head. And cause I keep, you know, I, I keep wondering and I think that a lot of, folks who are out there wonder, okay, what the, it doesn't seem like it's going faster or is this sort of surreal or, or a whole bunch of things that are, are, are running through here. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, things are moving quickly. Uh, I'm starting to get more, you know, as, as Julie goes out and talks with people, as I go out and talk with people, I'm getting more nodding heads in the room uh, that are starting to understand it. I think both from the, both from the, in, as I like to call it, both the heart and the head perspective, mm-hmm. um, they get the intellectual investment argument um, and then they get the the moral argument i think that that uh that sits behind it and yeah i you know uh, i all i can do is hope that that it gets picked up more and 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 that people uh uh, people start thinking about things in this way now as far as you you know you mentioned esg i think the hard thing now and and this is and things are moving very quickly with esg and everything's going to get is and, and and the world is getting reassessed um you know almost by the minute in terms of okay where are the white hats and where are the dark hats here and and how do you know how do i get in with the right with the right camp on it so we don't position ourselves as an esg thing one because it's so personal two we don't screen anything out in the portfolio so um you know i I think the big one there is energy that people care a lot about so we're we're, you know we have exposure to oil and gas now Mm -hmm. that exposure shifts from you know uh, formerly russia saudi arabia other authoritarian producers to norway canada more democratic ones. So, and, and, you know, if you run us through screens that various people, uh, you know, various services have, we'll actually look better than purported ESG specific funds, because I think democracies, as you tilt that direction, they will generally have more of those type qualities. In them. Um, so w- it encompasses a lot. But again, the ESG and impact stuff is, 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 is so is so personal that I prefer to stay away from that. But, I mean, obviously, we can agree that supporting these democratic countries who do have intentions and being far more conscious in the environmental changes and the environment issues that we have. I guess we kind of agree that most of the democratic countries in your list kind of support that initiative of wanting to make some environmental changes. Yeah. It's a high score. So all of them, right? Exactly. That's in, uh, the, it, so the, the, you're, you're getting that embedded in the democracy tilt, but I, again, because the, again, it, so if I sit and I say I'm an ESG fund, I have the risk of something coming up to me and saying, well, you hold X, Y, and Z energy companies in the portfolio. How can you call yourself any, uh, how can you call yourself? Right. Well, okay. So I know <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, it's that, it's that, and that's, and that's, and, and that would be, and, and for me, that would be a common, that would be a common complaint. Right. Um, I, I, but I, would I tell you that you get that there are environmental benefits 
to us and that it's not a zero sum game. Yeah, I'd say that. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, the, there are all kinds, I mean, the, again, this is now the, 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 the government regulators now are going to start to clamp down on claims. You've seen it with, with, uh, with what's happened with, um, Goldman and, and, and others who have, you know, had these, you know, generalized ESG claims. And it's like, well, how are you going to, how are you going to exactly what are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. So until those rule, until those, those get defined, we'll see how that, uh, well, I, I will politely, I will politely decline. <laughs> You're definitely carving up your own, I guess you could say, branch or thought about it, it seems like. So we're well, looking forward to see how that works out. I want to go back a little bit because you, you mentioned um, earlier about scores and how there's scores for countries. And I think 10 being the highest, right? Correct. And then one being the lowest or is it zero? I don't know. Well, I mean, it's on a, nobody gets a zero, nobody gets a 10, but it's okay. a zero, it, it's, it's a zero to 10, uh, uh, it's a zero to 10 dimension on that. And there are 60 indicators that is applied to this democracy score, correct? Yeah. So it's, um, uh, it's in five, it, you know, in five major buckets, generally 60 questionnaires on it. And we, it, it's, yeah, it's from the, it's from the economist, right? So mm -hmm. what they do is they divide it amongst, you know, sort of electoral process and pluralism. So civil liberties, functioning of government, political participation, and political culture, right? And in there's, you know, they're looking at, you know, things like, um, you know, whether national elections are free and fair, security of voters, influence of foreign power on government, and the capable, uh, and the, you know, capability of civil servants to implement policies. You know, it's, it's a... Um, Very detailed and... Yeah, yeah. And, and, well... Uh, so it's been around the, the reason the reason uh, the reason we went with it um, was that it had been around since 2006. It was well established. It's outside of the United States. So um, I think anybody that that would accuse it, uh, you know, a U.S. company using a U.S. index, putting the thumb on the scale. Right. So it's, uh, you know, all of that stuff. We wanted to, to come up with a, at least a process that would hold up to uh, some degree of, you know, as much objectivity as we as we possibly could build into the system. And it's 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 transparent and, and you know, again, uh, you know, out, outside of our uh, of our purvey. And because it's got this track record, it's I think we think that at least for the next several years, it, it'll be hard to have that system gamed because it'll be fairly transparent to people if they, if something sort of gets in the works there. Um, uh, and it accomplished what we were looking to accomplish was come up with some way of adjusting a portfolio to, uh, for lack of a better term, mitigate sovereign risk in an equity portfolio. Mm. So what I wanted to ask was one of the indicators, we'll call it, this is what it's called, was internet. And obviously, we all know the power of social media has had in our gener in this this generation, right? Do you and obviously we know what's happening in countries this cu last couple of oh God, it's been a year with the pandemic the Ukrainian war and now what's happening in Iran where social media has played a huge role and I maybe that goes into you know ties in with the internet and access I am curious in your personal opinion how social media will play into the future of these democratic countries and how their scores will be impacted because of that well yeah I because I, I think it, that comes all down underneath the same the same headline of freedom of the press uh, I mean it would be it would be you know uh, freedom of information access. And levels of censorship and levels of censorship there. I think that the yeah, as, as a society, we're going to have to we're probably going to struggle with uh, for for a little while in terms of you know, of figuring out where those where the boundaries are and you know and and what's credible and not and what's not credible and and uh, you know uh, somehow we made it through you know years of having the National Enquirer right at our right, <laughs> right at our grocery stands and 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 uh, you know somehow we we were able to start to distinguish things from you know what what was what was what might be real versus what might be a little bit of bluster yeah but and and we're gonna and we're gonna I, you know, I think we're going to continue with all of that. The I try and 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 and, and take the longer view uh, and, and the hopeful view around it. There are a lot of things that I think will are going to manifest themselves over the next you know over the next several years uh, that that will start to clarify things. I think you know if we're if we're to a to a place where globalization is a little bit in retreat, we're going to you know use that as an argument. And you know what are the implications for that? What are the resets that are going to be happening? Um, how do 
that, how does that affect, uh, you know, as we, we look at energy prices now, what are, what are we, uh, yeah. know, what are we, what are, where, where do we, where do we forecast, uh, you know, energy prices going forward, food, you know, so I mean, folks, as we move into a high end inflationary environment, are going to tend to focus on, you know, the, the basic needs, shelter, you know, food and energy. Um, and, um, so, uh, that, that's gonna, you know, th- those things are gonna, are gonna, you know, bring some focus to stuff and there might be some ramifications around that. Um, and so, yeah, you know, as, you know, as we were, as we were talking earlier, you know, it's, it's now everybody's front porches in your living room mm-hmm. and we're getting, we're, we're, we're now having to, to get used to that and, and how that feels and, and, and boundaries on both and, and, and where boundaries need to be set on all that versus, mm-hmm. you know, um, how much gets sunshine, how much needs to be. Uh, yeah, uh, how much uh, privacy needs to be retained? Who gets access to what information? Uh, to what information uh, in a digital society, uh, and how security around that can be maintained uh, right. in, a, in, in a in a free society? Uh, and are going to be some you know some very uh, how you build up a culture around uh, keeping those relationships sacred. Mm-hmm. Uh, for lack of a better term, uh, because there, there, there's, you know, we had so much is so much is said, written and permanent and 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 uh, of record, whether it's a financial transaction or or an email. OK, what happens with all that? Yeah. And, and and who owns it? And <laughs> all these things are going to be really, really, really interesting, uh, 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 you know, intellectual uh, problems to work out going forward. A whole new set of problems and worries, I guess. It's different. <laughs> you pick your problem. Problems. I mean, this is the. I mean, this is the the, the thing. Is is what 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 problem are you going to pick here? And, and so far, this is what we've chosen. Chris, you come a, from a very international background in a sense that you traveled. You said your family's worked in Venezuela. Um, you know, earlier we talked about you just traveling around the world. Has that and having worked for um, Democracy Investments and having obviously looking into other countries, has that at all changed your perspective and how you think of things, whether it be personally or professionally? Just how having that luxury of seeing so many different things. Yeah, you come back to just feeling that you were really blessed to be born at this time in this place in this I mean, yeah, it's just the if if you don't come away from uh from traveling around the world going, yes, those are beautiful people with beautiful food and wonderful cultures and all those kinds of things. Holy smokes, I'm really happy I was born where I was when I was and 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 all of that. If yeah, if you don't have a whole a whole lot of gratitude after that, you might have missed something. <laughs> and, and 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 so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the biggest the biggest thing is that I'm blessed and highly favored, and, and <laughs> I'm, I, I I give thanks every day for it. That's amazing. I mean, to be able to have experiences, I think that probably helps you in kind of distinguishing many things and keeping you with an open mind. You know, so well, and and that's the I mean, again, you meet beautiful people, beautiful cultures, and and the, to be able to drink all of that in, I mean, oh, and, uh, the, the well, both both literally. And metaphorically, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, well, first of all, uh, I, I, Latin culture for me is is is, is wonderful. They are the most. Uh, they are very warm, open hearted welcoming people like as, as I, I was telling you before we started I just got back from a visit to Puerto Rico they're just fantastic and just wonderfully welcoming and and to be able to it, it is about the people about the relationships that you have and, and getting the different perspectives and learning the histories and understanding you know where people come from where their cuisine comes from where their music comes from how all these things have migrated around especially when you start talking about the Caribbean and, and those areas and all the cultural things you go to down to Argentina and you have a you know a big European influence down there and the port and the, the Portuguese influence in Brazil and so it, there's it's um, you know it's just it's all the it's all the wonderful people and all the smiles you get to see and all the laughs you get to have. So that's what it's uh, that's what it's about. It's the most rewarding part. <laughs> So I know we, we talked for quite some time, so I don't want to take any more of your time, but I do have a couple more questions. Sure. Your company is a little bit over a year old, I think, right? Is that correct? We're, we're, we're two years. Two we're, years. We're, uh, okay. Yeah, two years old now. Wow. wow. Yeah. Time flies, huh? It does. <laughs> what are your visions for a company? And what are changes or impacts you hope to see over the next one to five years? So the, my flip answer would be, I would love to be obsolete and out of business tomorrow, because that would be... <laughs> <laughs> that would that would mean that we're. I mean, I, I think anybody in, in this kind of a strategy or or 
that has a little bit of a purpose built to it should be like, I really hope I go out of business. And the sooner I go out of business, the better it is. Yeah. Or that might, or that that strategy becomes, that at least that strategy uh, be, becomes obsolete. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'll be affected by that problem anytime soon uh, <laughs> or reason or, 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 or reasonably soon. You know, for, for us, it's, it's, uh, you know, in part mission driven uh, in that, uh, we would like folks, as I, as I was saying earlier, to at least uh, take a really hard look at this, these types of methodologies that, that we and others or uh, a couple of others are doing mm -hmm. um, and consider that for, for, for adoption in your, in your, in your portfolios. And we would come out with various flavors as we would, as we would build on, obviously emerging, you know, we could do uh, develop versus emerging markets because uh, right now we're, we're the entire, we're the entire world fixed. There will be opportunities within fixed income. There will be opportunities, you know, for folks who, for ESG investors who want to do an ESG cut and then maybe a democracy cut or a democracy cut and an ESG cut. However, there, there are lots of different ways it can be sliced and, you know, we'll try and follow where investors your demand takes us on those things. Well, that kind of leads me up to my other question. And this is strictly for you personally. I know you're the CIO, but is do you have any particular issues like human rights issues that you would love to tackle <laughs> if you are given just any opportunity, something that you want to fix the world in? If you don't, um, it's fine. <laughs> no, well, look, I, I I come from a libertarian background. I, I this, To me, this is really, it's really about uh, about freedom. And, mm -hmm. and the if you, you go through and, and I tell your listeners to you know go to the Economist and take a look at, at the uh, at the Economist Democracy uh, Index and the report on that and 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 the state of, of democracy and individual freedom and and how the you know authoritarianism uh, is rising uh, has been rising on the planet and you know to me that's a really big problem and so you know I can only do so much in this particular state to go to go tackle to go tackle something like that but from where I sit and and the intellectual exercise that I did to where could have some sort of an impact. Um, this was sort of it. Just one, I could see that there was an opportunity to have this kind of a split between what market cap and, and this into the, the opportunity to help provide an incentive. Because again, it, 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 it's now we're just a, you know, we're just a strategy that I think can outperform. At scale, we're a weapon, quite honestly, because then, then those scores matter to, to bigger players and they start to have to watch. And there's a degree of accountability in terms of where investment flows go. So if we can get that in, in, in that freedom and allow people to to, to have greater self-determination, I, I, I think that uh, so much potential can be unleashed. Oh, I love that. What a great way to, to kind of summarize all, all of the things we talked about. So, okay. So my final questions that I ask this to every single podcast, yes, we have is who inspires you and why? Okay. So I'd seen that you'd asked the question there and, and you, so you go through sort of the, the list of all the famous people and you, and, <laughs> and, and um, I, I'll, I'll tell you who, I, I'll tell you who lately has inspired me. There's a guy at my, there's a guy at my gym who is, let's see, he's, he's, he's not a big guy. He's, uh -huh. he is, he is very short and <laughs> not fully gifted whatsoever. <laughs> But he is in the gym busting his ass at 5.30 every morning. Wow. And I sit there and I look at this guy and I go, he is making uh, making the absolute most of everything he's got. I pick it up, dude. I get inspired by, I, well, the folks that do that. I mean, and, and that's the thing is you, you sort of go through, you know, well, who at a big level? I, I get inspired by the everyday beauty and the triumph of them of, you know, that conquering story that, you know, overcoming whatever it is, whether it's the, you know, immigrant or refugee who's been, you know, come to a new land with absolutely nothing and makes it. A, that's inspiring, right? I mean, whether it's the person with the handicap that overcomes that, you know, for and achieves some that it, to me is in, is in, is inspiring. So I love to look for those things every day because when I, you know, as soon as I think I'm having a bad day or whatever happening, I'm like, okay, I, I got, I got to, I got to put on the big boy pants because they're <laughs> folks way above me who are way tougher than I am. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's where I find inspiration from these days. Oh, that's beautiful, Chris. It really is. I mean, you know, we were in our third season of the podcast and I've been asking this since the beginning. And people probably wonder, our listeners, like, why does she ask this all the time? It's because these kind of answers. It's that 
ability for someone to surprise you, but also reconnect humanity together and say it could be the simplest thing, but it could be the most profound. So I love hearing the answers from you and from everyone, future, past, present, because it's beautiful. Uh, every answer to me is beautiful and I love hearing them. But yeah, I, I, I had a great time conversating with you. I love learning more about your democracy investment and really excited to see what you guys come up with. In the well, I, 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 I hope so. We're, 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 we're scraping along and, and, and uh, you know, it's, 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 it's touching, it's, it's touch and go right now, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling a little Lord of the Rings. I'm, I, we, we got to we're, we're planning to come back here and uh, you got to say, you got to stay at least optimistic about it. And, and um, yeah, I appreciate you reaching out and, and giving me the opportunity to tell the story. I hope it was good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Chris, don't forget about us. See your faces out of San Francisco when you guys are, are big and doing those national TVs and maybe you can come back and tell us how this uh, God, I, yeah well from, from your list to god's ear but i god's ear but i don't know we'll see we'll see how that all we'll see how that all comes together. so the other way so the other thing yeah. now so uh, i'll tell you you know the, the absolute silliness in the world that needs it right now um i said i mentioned i was just down in in, in san juan puerto rico and um my buddy had turned me on to the uh, netflix show uh, mucho mucho amor the walter the walter mercado story okay for guilty pleasures uh, it, it's it's hilarious but do have you ever heard of uh, have you ever heard of this guy okay yeah. so he was a he was he, a crazy he was like Liberace meets astrology in Puerto Rico wow okay that's that's kind of I think that's kind of how the that's probably the easiest way to wrap your mind around it as quickly as you can but he would uh, just the, the 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 thing on Netflix is fantastic and he would always sign off with y mucho mucho amor <laughs> and it's just it's like and it's but in a, in a world where we need like now we like it's like that's what we need that's what we just, need you know you know so it's, it's, it's either Ringo Starr, Peace and Love, or, or Walter Mercado. <laughs> mucho, mucho amor. Anyway. Well, I think everyone will be listening is probably really very much laughing out loud. And thank you for I hope so. for today, Chris. I, I think everyone will appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. Thank you very much thank for you. having me. Thank you for listening to this month's episode of the CFA Society San Francisco podcast. We hope you enjoyed the engaging discussion. Please stay tuned for more episodes of this podcast featured every fourth Tuesday in our weekly newsletters and through the CFA Society San Francisco podcast channel, available through most major podcast apps.